morning. Welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. Uh, our call to worship comes from Luke 24. Hear these words. Luke 24, verse 48 through 53 says, You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. As we enter this time of worship, let's bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, as we prepare to worship today, we ask that you will stretch our imagination to sense the majesty and mystery of your ascension. Help us to perceive how Jesus' presence in heaven can give us confidence in our praying and hope for the future. Christ, help us all who struggle to worship you as Lord, to perceive beauty and glory of your sovereign form. Help us all who struggle to worship you as heavenly priest to discover the beauty and power of your ongoing prayer for us and with us. Lord, as we worship this morning, we pray for your spirit to guide us so that, may, that we may lay all of our burdens at your feet and worship you with our whole heart. Amen. Let's stand and sing together, All Hail the Power of Jesus. stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who plans to bless us with his unrelenting love. Rejoice. Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. 
children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, but with sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a Father who will never let them go. Rejoice, come and lift your sickness, all our sorrows, Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us, he is walking with us still, turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. God's saints around the world today rejoice. It is Sunday, the tomb is empty, and Jesus is alive. And today we confess our faith in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God greets you with good news. His promises of grace and mercy and peace are for you now and forevermore. Amen. Please take a few moments this morning to introduce yourself to someone nearby and welcome one another to worship. How you doing, young lady? Good, how are you? Are you all done with school? Yeah. Nice. Good. Sleeping in? Yeah. <laughs> Dad's not sleeping in. <laughs> Morning. What's up, big guy? <laughs> hey, Mark. Morning.
This morning we continue with our series studying the book of Ephesians entitled Practice Resurrection. Following Easter, what does it mean to live a life in which you practice the truth that Jesus is alive, that the tomb is empty? And so we've been thinking through the words of the Apostles Paul from the book of Ephesians about what it means to practice resurrection. We're thinking today from Ephesians chapter 3, and in a couple of moments I'd like to read those verses for you, but allow me to introduce our Um, time this morning with this word, mystery. Paul uses it many times in Ephesians chapter 3, and it gives a focus to what we're thinking about today, the mystery, a spiritual mystery. We're used to mysteries. They're all around us. They capture our attention. Um, They make life interesting when there's a mystery. Uh, My kids used to like the mystery of Clue Jr., Um, When you play Clue Jr., then you have to figure out which pet has um, hidden which toy in the clubhouse. And when the mystery is unfolded, you win the game. And so we like mysteries. They, They entertain us. They make life have a spark or an edge that we want to find out what happens. A couple of magazines from my house use mystery as a way to entice you to read. Um, This one says 50 secrets, 50 secrets hospitals won't tell you. You're like, I want to know about that, right? I've been to the hospital. I want to know what what they're not telling me, that that thing that's secret or hidden. Or 50 secrets to a sharper brain. You know, what do I eat? What do I do? How do I live to have a, a sharper brain? Or this one, if you're flying this week, 50 secrets your pilot won't tell you. Um... Those things that seem mysterious or hidden or, or covered over. Um, there's all kinds of mystery. I mean, there's the mystery of the pyramids. How in the world did they get those giant stones on top of each other in such perfect order? Still, it seems no one quite knows what happened. But in all mysteries, there's this. There is what really happened, and it's already occurred. It's fact. The mystery is trying to uncover it and discover it. 
It's not like you're trying to figure something out that's never been figured out before. You're just trying to discover something that actually already happened. And that's kind of the way it is with the spiritual mystery that the Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians 3. He's saying God is revealing the mystery. That is, he's uncovering something that has been fact for a long time. And now is the time he's chosen to make it known. And so it's not mystery like um, it's um, evil or creepy or, or unusual. It's just mystery in the sense that God has chosen now to lift the veil and make something that was hidden known. And so I'd like to think with you about Ephesians chapter 3, the first 13 verses. Um, And before I read it for you, there are a few things that might be helpful to take note of in the text um, that help us understand these words from the Apostle Paul. And so take a look at these things from the text in verses 1 and 6 and 8 and 10. Um, In verse 1, Paul describes himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. It's likely that he was in prison in Rome when he wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus. Um, But when he was in prison in Rome, he wasn't in a dark, dingy cell in the bottom of a castle somewhere. He was probably under house arrest, which means um, he was free to move about within a certain radius Um, of the praetorium or the place where, you know, they were taking care of his legal business. It took about two years for his trial um, to come to an end. So they weren't going to keep him in an old dingy cell for that long. He was a Roman citizen. Um, And so they put him under house arrest. Maybe today you'd think about it like he had to wear a tether. You know, he could move about, but um, somebody always knew where he was. And so he had limitations, but not the 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 in-the-basement prison kind of limitations you might imagine. When he starts chapter 3, it seems like he's going to continue on where he was in chapters 1 and 2 with another gold nugget of spiritual truth to share with the church in Ephesus, and then he pauses. And so verses 2 through 13 are really an aside. He's going to start this thought, and then he says, well, let me tell you before I continue. And he gets personal. Up till then, he had been teaching truth about who God is, who Jesus is, how the world fits together, where faith comes in, how God's grace is over all of it. And it seems like he's going to continue on sort of in that vein, one thing after another after another. And he says, well, let me tell you about what this means to me. And so verses 2 through 13 are an aside from the thought that starts in verse 1. And so next week, we'll actually pick up his thought from verse 1 it continues in verse 14. And so Paul is saying, truth about God is incredibly important, but it's also personal. It's important to make sense of the world, but it also affects a human being, and it affected him deeply. And so his aside about being a prisoner lets you see Paul, the person, um, for a few moments. And then in verse 6, I'd like you to just note as you're listening um, that the word together is repeated three times, and whenever you're reading the scriptures, something is repeated, it's like a highlighter on that particular thought. Together, together, together. And then a couple of beautiful terms um, that we shouldn't just skip over. In verse 8, he says, the boundless riches of Christ. Other translators describe it this way, the unsearchable riches of Christ, or the inexhaustible riches of Christ, or the unfathomable riches of Christ, that when you think about Christ and the the things that he provides, they are too deep for you ever to get to the bottom of them. That's the term that he's using. Um, His endless supply of grace and blessings. And then finally, the last term that I don't want you to miss is the manifold wisdom of God. I thought, manifold wisdom, what does he mean by that? He's talking about the wisdom of God having layers to it, like on a tapestry. Um, It has texture to it. Uh, Many layers, it's variegated, it's intricate, but it's wisdom. It's the truth of God being lived out in action. And that's what wisdom always is. When you pray to God, and the scriptures say, ask for wisdom and he'll grant it in abundance, that's not a God raising your IQ. Wisdom, when you pray for it, is, God, show me what to do in this situation. It's truth in action. 
And so this is the manifold, many-faceted, variegated, intricate wisdom of God lived out. And um, he says that's going to happen in the church, and that's going to have a huge effect in all the world. So hear these words from the Apostle Paul from Ephesians chapter 3. I'd like to read for you the first 13 verses. Remember, verse 1, he starts, and then he sort of steps to the side and says, but let me tell you this first. This is God's holy word, Ephesians 3, chapter 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to you, made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit, by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my suffering, for you which are your glory. May God bless his word to us this morning. So in this long aside from Paul where he gets personal, he spells out a number of things, but at the end, I believe for us today, this is the main idea he wants us to think about. And that is, in the form of a prayer, our Father... Thank you that in Jesus, the impossible becomes reality. For the Apostle Paul to see God bringing Jews and Gentiles together, and not only uniting them, but saying, in God's eyes, they are equal, that was the greatest impossibility that he could ever imagine. There was no way that would happen without a miracle of God. In fact, there was just no way it would ever happen. It wasn't on his radar that God would not only unite people who were different for millennia, but that they would be equal before God and that they would stand before him in the same way. And so the mystery that he's talking about is this desire from God that was way back in the creation when he made Adam and Eve that people would be one. They'd be one before him because they're all made in his image men and women and boys and girls, made in his image. And it wouldn't matter what their ethnicity was. It wouldn't matter about their country of origin. It wouldn't matter their economic status. It wouldn't matter their IQ. But the, the mystery of God would be that all these people in Jesus Christ are now before God as his one people, his chosen people, his blessed people. The divisions are destroyed between Jews and Gentiles. What kind of divisions would you think of today that are between people that God would call to be one and together? Whatever you can think of, God says in Jesus Christ, they are brought together. That the divisions are destroyed in him. He also says that grace overcomes. What seemed impossible has become a reality. And Paul's talking about himself. He says, it seems to me that it's impossible that a man who was persecuting the church of Christ now becomes a church planter 
for the church of Christ. And so Paul, despite his great intellect, and when we look at his life, we're like, Paul, you wrote most of the New Testament. How could you talk in such a, you know, self-degrading kind of way that I'm the least of all? Well, remember, he was standing there saying, yep, I agree, that one should be possibly put to death because of their faith in Jesus. He'd be there giving his agreement. And now he's a church planter for that same cause. And so many times when you read the Apostle Paul, he says, I cannot believe that God's grace is this big. I cannot believe that a persecutor becomes a church planter. And so for you and for me, we discover this beautiful truth that nothing from my past, nothing from my past can make me useless in the kingdom of God. In fact, nothing from my past can keep God from using me for his glory and his purposes in the world. If you think there was something, it would probably be putting Christians to death. That would seem to kind of eliminate you as a candidate for future ministry. And God says, no, my grace is even bigger than that. I would think that would give us hope. Nothing from our past can make us useless in God's kingdom. In fact, God, in his grace and mercy, can make any person useful for his mission in this world. Grace overcomes. But Paul still thinks of himself as the least. And if we've been down a rough road or over a lot of bumps, or we've stumbled and fallen again and again, we don't forget about that in our life because it reminds us of God's grace. It doesn't become the focus of our life, but it reminds us that I would not be here today if it wasn't for the grace of God. It's not because of who I am or what I've done. It's because of God's grace in me. In fact, in the end, it all becomes his amazing grace. So what seems impossible to you today? I believe the main idea God wants us to hear is that in Jesus Christ, the impossible can become reality. Where is there an impossibility in your life today that in Jesus it might become a reality? Everyone would have agreed it'd be impossible for that Saul, that persecutor of the church, to become a missionary and write what would be included in God's holy word, never going to happen. And so where is there an impossibility today that Jesus might make into a reality? We'll have time to bring to him our prayers in a couple of moments, but hang on to that that thought, that prompting from God. I wanted you to look at that word manifold wisdom just because it's an interesting um, uh, word choice by Paul to put those things together. But the context of where he puts that in the sentence and the thought that he communicates is even more remarkable. In verse 10, he talks about the manifold wisdom of God being made known through the church to those in the heavenly realms. And based on what he said in chapter 1, and based, if you know, about chapter 6, the chapter about spiritual warfare, it doesn't seem like he's talking about God's holy angels. He's talking about the spiritual forces of darkness. And so wonder with me for a minute about this, this thought, that through the church, based on verse 10, God puts the spiritual forces of darkness on notice that their end is near. Let's throw that up on the next slide. That through the church, God puts the spiritual forces of darkness on notice that their end is near. Do you think it's a discouragement to the evil one when God brought Jews and Gentiles together who had always fought one another? Do you think that when you show the love and kindness of God to a stranger, Is it possible it makes the demons shudder? 
Do you think it's possible that, that when you volunteer your time for God's glory and, and the blessing of others, that the devil trembles? Do you think it's possible that when you sacrifice something for someone else, that Satan shrieks? The church just has to be the church. I always tell people that when the church is doing what she should be doing, it's the most beautiful thing on the planet. When someone's hurting and the church shares those burdens together, it's a thing of beauty. When a community is connected to a church and people who maybe never have walked into her doors say, oh yeah, that's my church, and they give you three reasons why, they've never even actually been in the building. But they have connections. They've experienced the love of God. Someone knows their name. The devil trembles. Usually we're trembling because of what the devil might do in this world and in our life, but Paul says that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God will be made known to the heavenly beings. You just have to be the church. You just have to be the body of Christ. You just have to love others the way that God has loved you. Extend grace to them the way that God has extended grace to you. Forgive them the way that God has forgiven you. Help them the way that God has helped you. When the church is the church, the devil trembles because he knows his time is short. The end is near. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God will be made known. And so you and I are not just part of a gathering of human beings that like to get together and sing on Sunday. By being together, by being one, by living a life of love, by practicing the resurrection, we are part of God's cosmic plan to bring his kingdom here and have his kingdom come. So wonder with me about that when you reread verse 10. Could it be that through the church, God puts the spiritual forces of darkness on notice that their end is near. And then a couple of points for application today. I, I put them both in the form of a prayer. Here's the first one. From verse 13. Thank you, Father, that because of Jesus I can approach you with freedom and confidence. Therefore, I bring to you my blank. Why is Paul writing freedom and confidence? There must have been a time when the Gentiles were thinking, I can't come to God with freedom. I'm limited. Remember when we talked about that wall at the temple that limited Gentiles from going into the next arena that would be closer to the most holy place. They were used to limitations when it came to God, used to having to stand back, used to waiting in line and taking their turn and never being able to go past a certain point. He says, you can approach God in Jesus with freedom and with confidence, without fear, that you can come to him. In fact, later in the scriptures it'll say, approach the throne of God boldly. Who would dare to do that? Come to the throne of, of the creator of the universe, the Holy One, boldly? Unless he invited you in. Unless he said, do not be afraid. Unless he said, welcome my son, my daughter. I am so glad to hear from you today. If God didn't woo us in and pull us in and invite us in, We'd never have confidence. The evil one would keep whispering in our ear all the reasons why we shouldn't have confidence, all the things from our past, all the things that we've done, all the thoughts that we've had, all the mistakes that, that we've carried out. He'd say, why in the world would God ever listen to you? And the simple answer is because he loves me more than I ever imagined. Be quiet, because he loves me 
more than I deserve. Because of his grace, I come. Because of his mercy, I come. Because of who God is, I come with confidence and without limitation, with freedom and with confidence. So what is it that you've been holding back from God? Maybe only you know about it. Maybe a close friend knows about it, but for some reason you just don't talk to God about it. You pray, and you, you pray to him on behalf of others. Those who are in trouble, you intercede. Your heart breaks. But for you, where is it that you're not opening your heart to the freedom and confidence that God wants you to have so that you can talk to him about anything and everything. Sometimes our sin or shame or our questions seem to be the kinds of things that we just keep to ourselves. And God says, where are you going to find an answer to sin or shame or to your questions except with me? Come, come. Sometimes our fears or even our hopes, you know, they Oh, that's just, that's just too big of a hope. I couldn't even pray to God about that. What kind of father wouldn't want to wouldn't hear about the hopes and fears of the children that they love? Or my doubts, my loves, my passions. What are you keeping from God that you're not talking to him about in prayer? Paul says, because of Jesus, you can approach the Father with freedom and with confidence. Dating, marriage, family, faith, finances, foolishness. You fill in the blank. Thank you, Father, that because of Jesus, I can approach you with freedom and confidence. Therefore, I bring to you. What's on my heart. And then finally, this word of application Father in heaven, help me to focus on that which unites instead of divides. If the mystery of God that is finally being revealed is that in Jesus all people come together, Jews and Gentiles in the days of the Apostle Paul, we would think about it probably in terms of people from different countries and language and backgrounds, but, but all people in Jesus can be united it's so easy to think about the things that divide us and make us different. You don't have to talk to somebody very long to realize that, wow, they view life differently than I do. They view parenting differently than I do. They view finances differently than I do. And the differences seem to, to be in the spotlight for us. What would it look like if we again and again practiced putting the spotlight on what unites us. To take note of the things that divide us, how could you not, but to look for those things that are similar, the same, and uniting. If we really believe that Jesus is all in all, that all things were created by him and for him and through him, would it make sense to be able to look for Jesus in everything? in everyone. If everything is made by him and through him and for him, could you go to work tomorrow and be on the lookout for where the presence of Jesus exists? In the kindness or the forgiveness that you notice. In someone doing a job well done with the gifts that God has given them, with respect that is shown, with whatever it might be, could you be on the lookout for Jesus, who is the creator of all things, made by him and for him and through him, and find yourself united, <laughs> united with others instead of divided from them, to find your common ground, because Jesus is our all in all. What greater mystery is there than to live your life discovering again and again there is God.
his fingerprint, his handiwork, his miracle. The mystery, the joy of discovery again and again, day after day, hour after hour, there's God again, and there he is again, and there he is again, and here he is within me. Everywhere, in all things, to be on the lookout. So Father in heaven, help me to focus on that which unites instead of divides. For in the end, there really isn't anything that can unite us like Jesus himself. Do you think music could unite us? Probably not. Certain kind of church building unite us? Don't think so. Do you think we all dress the same and wore uniforms? Probably not. (laughs) You can't find something on this earth that could unite us. People from different nations, different cultures, different backgrounds, different lives, except the one who made us, the one who saved us, and the one who's with us. Let's pray to him together. Lord Jesus, how thankful we are that you are with us, that you are Emmanuel. And when you are with us, We want to see you. We want to know you. We want you to open our eyes to what you're doing. We want to see the evidence of your work, your kingdom being built. We want to see barriers being broken down. We want to see lives transformed. We want to see hearts softened, starting with our own. Lord Jesus, you are all in all. And things that are impossible from our perspective You make a reality simply by who you are, the Son of God, the life you lived, the sacrifice you paid, your defeat of death, your resurrection from the tomb, your ascension into heaven, and now your rule and reign over us, that what seems impossible to us, you keep making into reality. And we stand amazed. And the devil stands afraid just at the sound of your name. Oh God, thank you for saving us. And use us this week to proclaim this good news that the mystery is over and Jesus is the answer. We pray this in your precious name, Lord Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Respond and sing, build your kingdom. Unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop.
We continue to worship God this morning by bringing our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings before him. Your best gifts are received on behalf of the General Fund and our Level 3 Tuition Assistance Fund. And while those gifts are being received, if you're on the center aisle or in the balcony, please find the friendship folder near your seat and enter your name into it. Pass it down the aisle to those who are nearby that they may do likewise. Also, if you want to sign up to help with the mini soccer camp at Presidential Estates on Tuesdays this summer, um, from 12.30 to 1.30, we have an open door and an open invitation to come to Presidential Estates and to um, have an activity for kids following a, a lunch that's provided for them by the Jenison Hudsonville um, food lunch program, um, hot lunch program or food program. Um, and so we could use your extra hands. You don't have to know a lot about soccer. You could just manage a game. Um, where there's prizes, or you could actually be on a field doing a little scrimmage. So your soccer knowledge can be from zero to, I really love this sport and want to play every day. So um, we could use you on Tuesdays. Um, it doesn't have to be every week that you commit to. Um, you could just be there for a couple of weeks in the summer, Tuesdays from 12.30 to 1.30. And uh, if you want to help out in some other ways, you can do that a little bit beforehand as well. Um, starting as early as 11.30. So check that out in your bulletin. All you have to do is circle letter A and we'll contact you and let you know um, where we can use your gifts and talents to bless kids right in our neighborhood, especially in one that's um, the most under-resourced neighborhood in our community. Um, also want to let you know um, some prayer requests this morning. Um, as citizens of this planet, um, I'm sure that that is bothering you as much as me. <laughs> Should I grab a different microphone? All right, let's try it, otherwise I'll grab Nate's mic. Um, I know I have new batteries, so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, you know, when anyone dies in a terrorist act, um, our hearts break, and when children die, we, they break again. And uh, as you've seen reports from the UK, and then with Coptic Christians in Egypt, um, I'm sure your heart, like mine, just is heavy with sorrow and pleading to God and angry and frustrated and discouraged and depressed and all those things simultaneously. Um, continue to lift them up before our Lord and ask him to move his hand um, and to intervene and to care for those whose lives have been forever changed uh, for families. And so we ask you to, to be in prayer again um, this week for those places. We also ask you to pray for um, Les Knott from our church, who uh, went in for some tests this past week because he was feeling quite ill, and um, now he needs to have some more tests. He'll know some more results uh, after Tuesday. And he said, you know, please pray for me, but um, we really don't know anything specific until after Tuesday. So. Um, join him in prayer. Um, we celebrate with him um, and his wife um, answered prayers for their son, um, Brian, who had a cancerous tumor on his eye, and that was treated. And the first scans now, after some weeks and months of healing have taken place, have shown that the tumor has shrunk and there is no evidence of that cancer spreading, which um, is a great relief to them. They'll have another scan in September to um, make sure that that still remains to be the case. So um, on the one, the, the Knott family is celebrating that good news and they're interceding on behalf of um, Les and we ask you to join them in that. We also ask you to continue to be in prayer for um, Sherwin Hybor. Um, that's Sherwin Scott Hybor, son of Sherwin and Greta. Sherwin and Greta are still in California with their son who had lung transplant. Um, they expected him to be released from the hospital soon, but then they'll be staying close to the hospital for a three to four week return to the hospital to check on him, adjust his meds, um, and to keep a, a close eye on him. So they've been there for a while already. They plan to be there for a while longer with um, Sherwin and his family, and we just pray that God could extend his life um, through this gift of, of a new lung and a new freedom in his breathing. 
We also express our sympathy this week um, to um, Jen and Mike LaFaber and their family as they grieve the death of Jen's dad, Michael DeVries. Many of you would know him as a pastor or Reverend Michael DeVries. He's preached here on a number of occasions and um, a lover of God, his church and people, and especially his family. And um, we ask you to pray for their family as they are grieving. Visitation with the family is available tomorrow night, Monday, from 5 to 8 at Langelin and Sterenberg Funeral Home in Holland. The funeral is at Pillar Church in Holland at 7 p.m. on Tuesday. And when I walked in this morning, I saw um, two of Michael's grandkids up here on stage, <laughs> Nate and Nicole, and uh, they are bravely leading you in worship today. And uh, I thought, wow, that's something to stand up there. But it also made perfect sense, knowing who their grandpa was and uh, the legacy he leaves behind, that they'd also be leading a church in worship um, the, shortly after his death. So thank you for your courage today, and may God's comfort be with you and Mike and with Jen. Um, also just got a note from Bob and June Artema asking for your prayers. June Artema's younger brother, um, Harvey Dykegraff, is that right, June? Dykegraff, um, passed away this morning from cancer. He lived in Beaverton, Michigan. And uh, if you know Bob and June, you know that they've had a series of losses of family members in their life during the past several years, and we pray for God's comfort for you again. Um, so we will go to God in prayer. I invite the deacons to come forward. We're going to receive your gifts. Um, at the conclusion of this prayer, there will be an additional time to pray um, through a short video um, on this Memorial Day weekend to remember those um, who have given their lives um, for freedom and uh, for you to have a chance to pray with some prompts there as well. So uh, that's how this prayer will conclude. Let's go to God together. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts to you today and we pray for this world that you have created and the people in it. And this week, O oh God, especially, our hearts are heavy for places where terrorist acts have cowardly and maliciously um, taken the lives not only of innocent people but children as well. And so we pray for the people of the UK. We pray for Coptic Christians in Egypt God, we pray that your loving arms will meet them in these tragedies, that your healing hand will protect lives that are in the balance, and that your grace will surround um, all those involved. God, we pray that you would change the hearts of those who seek to do damage and to inflict pain and trouble on others, that you would turn them, that you would touch them, that you'd transform them, that you'd reveal yourself to them, that you'd put your fear into them, that, God, you'd do whatever it takes to, to bring an end to such violence. And, God, we pray here back where we live that you'd bless your church, that she might shine brightly for you in all things, that when we face trouble, Lord, may we face it as your children. When we celebrate, may we celebrate as your people. And so, God, we come to you and we lift up before you less not and we ask your healing hand to be upon him as he prepares for more tests and more diagnoses this week. We thank you for good news for his son Brian, and Lord, we ask that that healing may continue. We pray for Sherwin Scott Hybor on the other side of this land in, in California, O oh God, and we pray that the, the new lungs that he has received will bring new life and health and strength to him. And Father, we pray for your comfort for those who are grieving, and today we pray especially for the Lefebvre's and their family. And Lord, for all who grieve the, the death of Michael DeVries, um, a pastor in this community and a tool in your hand to be used for your glory in so many different ways, God, thank you for the good work that you have done through his life and the blessing you've brought to others through him. Care for those and comfort those who grieve this week and into the future his loss from us and celebrate his presence with you. Father, we pray for Tilly DeWeird as, with thanksgiving that she's been able to return to sunset following rehab. We thank you with Doug Dykstra that not only is he home from surgery, but that the reports showed that um, the tumors that were removed were benign. We thank you for that good news. 
We pray for Marge DeBoer and Joel Ems, for Joan Miller and Sharon Andersma, for Pete Van Rice and Carla Veldink, and Lord, others like them who continue to cry out to you with pain or disease, with worries about the next scan. God, we pray for grace to abound. We pray for healing to come from you, Lord Jesus, our great physician. We pray that for each of us today, O oh God, who come to you with a trouble, that we might sense your presence and your holding us in your loving arms as we move through the next hour and the next day and the next week. Lord, may we move down the path that you have prepared for us. May we move with confidence and with the freedom that you provide. And Father, for those who are far from home, in military service, on the mission field, far from networks of support, for those who are traveling over this weekend, God, we pray that your watchful eye will continue to be upon them. We thank you that wherever we are, you are there. In fact, O oh God, we are grateful that we couldn't even hide from you if we wanted to. And so thank you for being with us. Thank you for giving us your ear. Thank you for opening our hearts to you, and to your love and grace and mercy. Lord, we bring these gifts to you today. They represent the bringing of our lives to you in grateful obedience. Our time, our treasure, our talents, God, they all belong to you. Use them for your glory and for the blessing of the nations. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, today we remember those men and women who have died in service to our country. We pause to reflect on the lives sacrificed while protecting our freedoms. We confess that most days we are oblivious to the price paid by men and women in uniform, and yet we live every day in the freedom they laid down their lives to give us. So today, we recall the words of Jesus when he said, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And let us not forget that each life lost represents other lives that are left to pick up the pieces. We lift up widows and widowers, brothers and sisters, parents and children of the service, men and women who fought valiantly for our country. We ask for your peace and comfort to never leave them. God, we thank you for the lives of these men and women. May their memory and their service never be forgotten. Amen. Uh, as your gifts are continued to be received, let's sing Change together. Uh, it might be a new one for you, uh, but it's a great song uh, about the hope that we have in Christ and how our reaction should be to share that hope with others. So let's sing Change. name I've been changed I've been filled I've been found I've been freed I've been saved in Jesus blood I've been loved I've been cleansed and redeemed and released rearranged how can I show you that I'm grateful you've been so generous Jesus' name, we are changed, we are called, we 
Go with God's blessing. May the Lord your God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, may he bless you and keep you in his care. May he cause his face to shine brightly upon you, and may he turn toward you and be gracious to you. May the Lord your God fill you with his Holy Spirit now and forever. And all God's people say, Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>